Well, welcome, everyone. My name is David Azurad, and I'm the director of the B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics here at the Heritage Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you to the fourth and final event in our Lessons for Conservatives from Goldwater to the Tea Party event series. During the night of December 16th, 1773, something strange happened in the Boston Harbor. Somewhere between 30 and 130 men, some of them disguised as Mohawk Indians, boarded three merchant ships and dumped 342 crates of tea overboard to protest duties imposed by the British Parliament. In response to the Boston Tea Party, the British Parliament passed what came to be known as the Intolerable Acts to put the disgruntled colonies back in their place. A year later, the first shots were fired in the American Revolution at the battles of Lexington and Concord. Eight years later, the Treaty of Paris was signed and the war ended. America was born, and the Sons of Liberty, who had organized the Tea Party, had won. And then, an even stranger thing happened some two and a half centuries later. The Tea Party made a comeback. They're no longer dressed up as Mohawks. When they do dress up, they prefer a Thomas Jefferson costume or George Washington outfit. They're not dumping tea in the Boston Harbor to protest taxes. Uh, Boston, Massachusetts ain't exactly a hotbed of anti-government sedition these days. And they're not a few dozen men. Uh, roughly 20% of American adults identify now with the Tea Party. But the spirit animating them remains the same. What Madison described in Federalist 57 as the vigilant and manly spirit which actuates the people of America, a spirit which nourishes freedom and in return is nourished by it. Contrary to popular belief, the modern Tea Party did not begin on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange on February 19, 2009. Disgust at the excesses of Washington and at the orgy of spending had been brewing for a while. The bailouts had begun in the last nine months of George Bush's presidency. $30 billion for Bear Stearns, $300 billion for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, $85 billion for AIG. And then came TARP, a $700 billion bailout for Wall Street part of which ended up being using, uh, used to bail out GM and Chrysler. Less than two months into his presidency, Obama decided to one-up Bush, and he passed the $800 billion stimulus. Rick Santelli's call to arm on CNBC catalyzed a simmering grassroots upsurge. The Tea Party was reborn. And then came the intolerable act, Obamacare. A constitutional monstrosity whose passage was not a pretty thing to witness and which is only becoming more unpopular as people learn more about it. Opposition to Obamacare galvanized the Tea Party and made it a national movement to be contended with. More than five years later, the Tea Party has only grown stronger and it is now one of the principal forces in American political life. Questions, however, remain about its aspirations and its future prospects. We, for the most part, I think, understand what the Tea Party is, is opposed to, but it's sometimes unclear what they're for. Is there a positive vision that unites this amorphous movement beyond opposition to big, costly, intrusive, and unconstitutional government? How conservative is the Tea Party? How libertarian is it? What sort of a foreign policy should it embrace? Has it found a true home in the Republican Party? To shed some light on these questions, We've put together an all-star panel, and therefore I'm gonna keep the introductions rather short as I suspect you already know our speakers. First up will be Stephen Hayes, who is a senior writer for the Weekly Standard and a regular contributor on Fox News. He's also the author of three books, including a biography of Vice President Dick Cheney. Following him will be Jim Caesar, who's the Harry F. Byrd Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, the author of numerous books and an oddity in the academy, a professor of political science who actually understands American politics. <laughs> uh, Michael Needham will then wrap things up. He's the CEO of Heritage's sister organization, Heritage Action for America. And this year he was featured in Political Magazine's Political 50. And there was a telling quote by a staffer who said, referring to Heritage Action, they make 600 phone calls and have a member of Congress in the fetal position. Each of our panelists is going to speak for way. about uh, <laughs> 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Steve? 
Very good. Thank you, David, and thanks to uh, Heritage for inviting me here today. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was sitting out in that audience as a young researcher at the Heritage Foundation, which is my first job out of college, and I went to every single lecture I could possibly go to, mostly to make up for the studying that I didn't do in college. Um, but at, I found it incredibly uh, intellectually stimulating and, and loved my time at Heritage. Uh, I, I'm thrilled to be here today with Jim and Mike in particular. I kind of see my role as the, the sort of dumb, simple guy, journalist, who's going to make these guys look good just in comparison, just by my mere presence. Um, and the fact that I won't have anything nearly as profound to say as they do. Um, let me start by talking about uh, a time when I had some beers. I had beers with uh, an advisor, a top advisor to Mitt Romney. This is in the spring of 2012. And we were delayed in an airport and we had a beer and we started an argument. And the argument was, is the Tea Party a mood or a movement? And the more beers we had, the more heated the argument became. And my argument was, my side of the argument was, the Tea Party is, in fact, a movement. And his, the, the contrary argument was, no, no, the Tea Party is just a mood. I would like to think that the title of our panel here today, The Tea Party Turns Five, means that I basically won the argument, and I can call him, call him and, and gloat, because I don't know many people who can stay in a mood, whether a good mood or a bad mood, for five years, except for maybe Paul Krugman, but... <laughs> I don't know if he counts. He's in a bad mood for his entire life. Um, but I do think the debate really continues. And it, and it literally, the debate continues between me and this, and this fellow who's a friend of mine. Um, and it's possible, I think, that when we have this debate in 20 years where I'm, I'm old and my, my teeth are falling out and I'm drinking a beer in a rocking chair somewhere, um, we may not be talking about the Tea Party as we understand the Tea Party today, but I think we'll continue to talk about its influence. It seems to me that the Tea Party is less a new independent movement than it has been for the past five years, a reinvigoration, sort of another manifestation of the conservative movement, and uh, something that we've seen strengthen in response to overreach periodically. I think the, the nature of this lecture series of this panel series suggests the main inflection points. Goldwater, the Reagan revolution in the late 70s and early 1980s, the Republican revolution in the mid-1990s, and of course the Tea Party for the past five years. And it's remarkable in some respects that the Tea Party remains as influential today as it is, given the lack of positive media attention, uh, which is to say virtually none, and aggressive government moves against the Tea Party. Media love to talk about the Tea Party. It keeps um, writers at the New York Times, some of them employed almost full time. Uh, they like to focus on Tea Party losses and the problems that Tea Party, the Tea Party has caused Republicans. So they talk a lot about Sharon Angle, Christine O'Donnell, Ken Buck, Todd Akin, others. They don't talk as much about the Tea Party victories electorally. And I'm thinking here of people like Mike Lee, Marco Rubio, over Charlie Crist. That's hard to believe. Marco Rubio over Charlie Crist, just in 2010. Um, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, huge Tea Party victories, and we are seeing the influence uh, and impact uh, of those victories every single day. It's far from clear in the electoral context that the quote unquote good establishment candidates uh, that the media are fond of, of talking about would have even won their elections had they won the Republican primaries. Sue Loudon in Nevada, I don't think she would have won in a general election. As often as not, these candidates lost for a reason. They had no message, they had no ideas, they had no passion. And as often as not, these are the kinds of politicians who come to Washington to fill a chair, to have a title, rather than to do a job. The Tea Party has become sort of lazy media shorthand like neocon used to be at the end of the Bush administration. Everybody everywhere, you talk to any journalist, they would call everybody in the Bush administration a neocon. So Don Rumsfeld, who wanted to go into Iraq and get out almost immediately, was a neocon. It's hard to think of a more inappropriate label for somebody. But Tea Party has become mainstream media shorthand for conservatives I don't like. 
Beyond that, beyond the negative media attention, the Tea Party has survived and thrived despite IRS targeting, indisputable targeting. It's, it's uh, popular these days to, to talk to fellow reporters here in Washington who say, well, you know, everybody was targeted. Tea Party wasn't really singled out. You don't understand. Didn't you read Jonathan Weissman's piece in the New York Times? Everybody was targeted, so nobody was really targeted. But go back to Lois Lerner's first statement when she planted the question at the American Bar Association event. The reason she planted the question was so that she could apologize for the targeting of Tea Party groups, the targeting of conservative groups, the targeting of patriot groups. Even the President of the United States, in effect, apologized and said somebody would be held accountable for what he said was inappropriate behavior. So we know that the U.S. government, in the form of the IRS, its most feared agency, went after the Tea Party, and yet Tea Party influence continues. Now, I don't want to overstate things. We are a long way from the days when Nancy Pelosi was claiming to be a Tea Party member. Remember, she claimed that she was a spokesman, the rightful spokesman for the Tea Party. Nobody is making that claim. But at some point, there have been so many stories about the death of the Tea Party that it becomes a little bit silly. If the Tea Party were truly dead, we wouldn't have to have people reminding us all the time. When somebody dies, they die once, and you hear about it once. You don't need to continue to remind us. Let me just go over very briefly some exit polling uh, from 2010, 2012, and 2014 about support for the Tea Party. The same question was asked in each of the elections, and of course you'll have to account for the differences in the makeup of the electorate. But I find this interesting because 2010, of course, was, everybody believes, sort of the height of Tea Party influence, and, and 2014, I think the, the mainstream media perspective at least would be that the Tea Party is either on its way out or, as I said, is already dead. So in 2010, in the exit poll uh, in November, 40% of voters said they supported the Tea Party, 25% said they were neutral, 31% said they opposed. That's at the height of the, the Tea Party movement, supposedly. In 2012, with a very different electorate, 21% said they support, 42% said they were neutral, 30% said they opposed. So 31% said they opposed in 2010, 30% in 2012. And in 2014, 33% so they supported the Tea Party. 28% said they were neutral. 36% said they were opposed. What you see is that there's not a huge fluctuation in the kind of support or opposition that the Tea Party has had consistently from its birth through the most recent elections. I would argue that the Tea Party remains influential, particularly in Washington, because the debates that we're having, we're having today are largely dictated by the terms of the debates are dictated by the Tea Party. I remember listening to NPR a couple years ago. I actually do listen to NPR somewhat regularly. And hearing David Wessel from the Wall Street Journal, very good economics writer. Uh, I don't agree with him on, on much, but very good writer, very good reporter, now at Brookings. Lament that the debates over spending and the debt, all of the gridlock that was caused by debates over spending and the debt, has really kept legislators from doing the kinds of things that they were sent here to do, the kinds of legislation that the country really needs. And it was such an interesting moment, because as I was listening to him, my thought was probably the same thought that strikes you. That is what these people were spent to do, sent here to do. They were, they were sent here to debate spending. They were sent here to debate the debt ceiling. They were sent here to debate the size and scope of government. It's entirely appropriate that those are the things that we should be debating. That was the message of the 2010 elections in many respects. That was, in, in some ways, the entire point of the Tea Party was to refocus the debate onto different terms rather than going along with all of the sort of perfunctory spending, the, the rubber stamping of debt ceiling hikes, so that legislators could go on to the things that they are supposed to be doing. Uh, let me just wrap up by saying that continues today. There was a political piece yesterday about the uh, fights on Capitol Hill right now saying that Republicans will really struggle as the new Congress begins because they may be bogged down in debates over debt and the size and scope of government and spending. And my argument is, good. Republicans should be having debates over those things. That's in many ways why they came here. That's the entire problem, or much of the problem with Washington now. We spend too much money over too many years, and we did it by not debating these things. The debate I had with the Romney advisor about Tea Party influence came on the heels of Romney's attempt in 2012 to woo Tea Party voters at an event in Michigan in advance of the Republican primary there. 
He didn't do very well uh, at the event. He didn't do very well in general. Uh, there was very little enthusiasm for Mitt Romney among Tea Party voters, though many Tea Party voters showed up and vote, voted for him anyway. But as a mark of the continued influence of the Tea Party, look ahead to 2016. Does anybody here believe that Tea Party voters won't play a crucial, maybe a decisive role in shaping the debate in the 2016 Republican primaries? The, the, the race itself is likely to feature uh, at, at least a handful or a few uh, very Tea Party friendly Republican candidates, Rubio, Cruz, Rand Paul, Scott Walker, others I'm sure I'm forgetting people because every time I do a list I forget somebody. So that I think is in part the lasting impact. Those, this, these are the debates that we're having because of the enduring influence of the Tea Party. It's not going anywhere soon in part because the Obama presidency was premised on restoring faith in government for the expansion of government. That's what the president said in his first inaugural. It's what he said in an executive order on his first day in office. Restore faith in government in order to expand it. It failed. That experiment didn't work. Faith in government is at a post-Watergate low right now, and nobody's talking about expanding government other than Chuck Schumer. Uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much again for having me. Jim. <laughs> Thanks, David, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate on this panel with uh, two other uh, observers who actually have direct knowledge of some of the main figures who uh, have been part of the Tea Party and got it started and kept it going. Researchers in academia rarely uh, enjoy such access. Um, still, they, they uh, try to enlighten us enough, and uh, academics have produced numerous articles on the Tea Party and many, many books, including two by chaired Harvard professors on this subject. Yet there's been one researcher, however, I think who stands out through her persistence and perseverance and her ingenuity, and also her manner of acquiring information about the Tea Party, especially its uh, various elements and organizations, how they spend their money, who the volunteers are, maybe even details of their intimate life, and that researcher is Lois Lerner. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to say that it's a, a matter of um, great misfortune to those of us in academia that her magisterial work on this subject, uh, in a manner reminiscent of the uh, accident accidental burning of Thomas Carlyle's manuscript on the French Revolution, that hers may have been lost to posterity by virtue of a hard drive misfunction. Um, I did want to echo um, what was just said, that uh, Ms. Lerner may well have been the highest ranking government official uh, to have issued a formal apology for uh, unwanted touching of Tea Party records. <clears throat> and uh, this she did, as, uh, as was pointed out, in, a, in, a, in an apology. Um, it's been said that this apology was given without sincerity, that it was a kind of preemptive apology. You apologize in advance so as to avoid giving a real apology, and then of course blame it on others, in this case low-level bureaucrats. Um, Low-level would be part of the 99%, as distinct from higher levels who are part of the 1%. <laughs> Not only on low-level bureaucrats, but worse still, on bureaucrats who operated in this unknown place in the, uh, called <coughs> Cincinnati. Um, <laughs> Cincinnati, for those who don't know, is in Uzbekistan. <laughs> about 30 <laughs> kilometers southeast of Tashkent. <laughs> now, what is the Tea Party? Um, unfortunately, the, the, the term party, which comes from the uh, origins that David mentioned, um, uh, it's an unfortunate thing because it makes you think that it's organized as a political party, whereas it's in fact, as a, I, uh, I believe it's a movement, which means that it's open, porous, amorphous, its boundaries are vague and undetermined. Some um, Tea Party members uh, are, uh, take one position, others uh, other positions. There's no central office. So it's a movement, if you think back, like the populist movement, like the progressive movement, and the Occupy movement on the left, and so forth. All such movements are open and porous with different strands. And it has all the characteristics, I think, uh, of a movement, which is to say characteristics excesses, which can and should be criticized, and characteristic uh, advantages, energy in particular, which it's brought uh, to American politics. 
Now, if you want to characterize the Tea Party without malice, um, I'll get to those who do it with malice in a minute, but uh, it's fair to say that it's, I think, first, proudly populist. Uh, by populist here, I mean it, it uh, spontaneously engages in popular action. It uh, actually dis dislikes rigid organizations. It shuns establishment figures um, of all sorts, almost as a kind of prejudice. If you're in the establishment, somehow you're tainted. And uh, I'd add to that um, that it has uh, been, been unable to uh, control um, uh, m m many of its own membership, being this kind of populist and amorphous uh, movement. Uh, now, what else is characteristic of the Tea Party? Its emphasis upon uh, unlimited spending, spending uh, unlimited spending relative to government income, <clears throat> hence massive debt, and therefore also to intergenerational injustice, that is, uh, this generation, assuming uh, all the advantages and putting the debt off on, on subsequent generations. And then I would say another characteristic of it is it tries to connect itself directly to a view of government found inside of the Constitution and in the origin, American origins. Um, that's an important element, this connection to the past and to the Constitution. And therefore, now moving it up to the last couple of years, um, a concern with lawless disregard of constitutional practices uh, found today, I, I think in 2014, emphasized mostly a kind of Tea Party movement towards illegal immigration and uh, executive and administrative overreach. Now let me turn to the, the malice, because that, that's actually very important. The Tea Party has served a function for the, uh, the conservative movement, but it's also served an important function for the left. It has served as the symbol of delegitimate, delegitimate and, uh, <coughs> behavior in American politics. It's a symbol and has been used as a symbol of extremism. Every distortion imaginable has been attached to the, to the Tea Party to discredit it. Um, often its own views uh, are cast aside and uh, whatever uh, sinister motive one can think of is uh, reputed to be sponsored by the Tea Party. So uh, though the Tea Party spoke of uh, debt, its critics said that it was actually a racist institution or a sexist movement, and so on and so forth. It's openly attacked and vilified from the President of the United States openly on down. Not just, um, it's not just therefore what's uh, misguided about the Tea Party, but a further step is taken. The Tea Party is fundamentally an illegitimate movement. The Republican Party itself is mildly illegitimate, but that's the soft and flabby outside. The core of the Tea Party is fully and entirely illegitimate. Its actions can be dismissed, and here's the interesting point, because it is so legitimate, anything it does, even within the formal characteristics of law, are uh, 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 um, a priori illegitimate. The left operates today under the notion of a higher law or a super constitutionality. So because the Tea Party does not compromise and now it's said that American politics must rest on compromise. Therefore, any action that it uh, takes is a priori illegitimate, and it's uh, quite correct for some other force coming from outside of normal constitutional channels to simply act without regard to constitutional forms. I think this has been the primary justification of what's been happening, not only in Washington, but in the commentaries of political scientists in Washington who have invented these categories of polarization and paralysis, and having invented them, go on to say this is fundamentally incompatible with the good of America, therefore some sort of extra constitutional action is justified, hence uh, these excesses of presidential uh, discretionary action. Now just a few observations about the accomplishments and problems of the, the Tea Party. Its first comp uh, accomplishment, I would say, is bringing the national debt onto the front burner and make, making people think about the problem of the debt. Uh, this may be receding a little bit uh, from 2010 when it really was at the center of American politics. That's been lost a little bit. But they've succeeded at least in, in making this, uh, Americans aware of this. And they've succeeded, as I mentioned, in putting forward this idea of intergenerational injustice. They are the ones, the Tea Party, that reminded us 
on the fact that if you spend today, someone will have to pay it to tomorrow. Does one generation, as Je Jefferson actually had put it in some of his letter, have the right to obligate uh, a, a future generation without its consent? They've succeeded, and I think this is uh, really most important to hear about this idea of, of debt. Not so much at the federal level yet, and we spend too much time thinking about the federal level, but at the state level, where you've seen successes in the beginning of a movement to control public unions, which could be said to be, to this point, its greatest actual achievement. This is not only taking place in Republican states, but it's going on to former Democratic states where they see that some control of public unions is absolutely essential for, the, uh, for, for assuring that there's funds in the future to spend on other things besides pensions. The problems uh, with the indebted problem, they haven't found a way yet of accomplishing this, the Tea Party, at the uh, federal level, because uh, they haven't uh, exercised full and plenary power. And this, I think, has led to some tactical blunders of which we're, we're aware. Uh, also, perhaps, to achieve part of the goal, which they did through sequestration, it could be argued that the Tea Party, or parts of it, turned its back too much on defense spending. Now, the second uh, accomplishment has to do with bringing the Constitution back into public discourse. Saying that the Constitution could be a guide for the thinking of a political party and a program that is another role for the Constitution, the role it played in the 19th century where politicians would actually debate on what does the Constitution allow and what does it mean. As distinct from the view we normally have of the Constitution, certainly my students do, that it's a Constitution is just a matter of individual rights protected by courts. And uh, political parties and movements uh, shouldn't speak of, the, of these matters, just leave it to the courts. It's brought back the Constitution as a kind of popular document and even made it uh, be read on the uh, house floor of the House of Representatives to the amazement of the previous speaker. Now, there's a problem here as well. Often, I think, there's a deficient understanding of the Constitution by the Tea Party. Um, I think because uh, some parts of it uh, are themselves uh, so oriented towards a libertarian <laughs> perspective, they imagine that if libertarianism is good, that the Constitution must be thoroughly liber libertarian. And therefore, I think that they've uh, undersold the role that government should play, particularly in the foreign realm. And they've taken dangerously uh, views, I believe, on limitations of the executive power in the foreign realm as well. The third accomplishment is to provide starch to the conservative movement, that is starch to the fabric softener of, uh, you could say, the establishment. So you have this uh, uh, kind of dialectic between the two. The, Tea Party introduces the, the starch, let's do something, let's not concede, uh, continue to fight. The fabric softener of some of the people in the establishment is, oh, get along. If the election in 2012 was for the president, therefore Obamacare is, uh, is supposed to be accepted and no longer questioned. No, says the Tea Party, it keeps fighting. So um, we're very much taken up with the deeper question of the control of words and their meaning. Uh, compromise is an example. Compromise is held to be, be good, uh, at least according to the establishment. So compromise means compromise with us, uh, meaning uh, the, the, the position of the presidents. That's what compromise has meant. So they're pious encomiums to compromise. And then it's said by many that after all the founders compromised, didn't they? Of course, this is said by f uh, people who criticized the founders for compromising with slavery or for compromising with the British. <laughs> compromise uh, should be asked about what? Uh, that's the more important question than compromise itself. In fact, compromise is not the only virtue. Uh, one should say something, I think, in favor of the virtue of obstinacy from time to time. Finally, the political effects of the, uh, the Tea Party since its inception in 2010. Well, um, the Republican Party uh, has gained enormously since 2010 in all realms except the control of the presidency. The House, now the Senate, but especially among the governors and the state legislatures. It's a sea change if you look at it, what's happened in this period in the relationship between the two parties. Now this could be 
You can ask yourself, because of the Tea Party, in spite of the Tea Party, or perhaps a little bit because of and a little bit in spite of the Tea Party. Those are the only three options. But that question has to be confronted when those who dismiss the Tea Party and its influence uh, very easily, they would have to ask this question, has all this gain been made by Republicans um, in spite of the Tea Party, which is a rather illogical proposition, although we do have in social sciences what we know, correlations are not always causation. So I conclude, I think, with a, a question that um, you already brought up very nicely. Um, without the Tea Party, Senator Chris, anyone? <laughs> Mike, you're up. Thank you, David. It's, it's always a pleasure to speak on a panel with the man who puts the hair in the Heritage Foundation. So. <laughs> but uh, I think Steve and, and Jim said most of what needs to be said, this being Washington, not everybody has said it, so I'll kind of plow forward. Um, but one, one of the things that Steve said towards the, the beginning of his remarks was that the Tea Party really isn't distinct from the conservative movement. I think that's an important um, point to, to kind of think on. One of the, the most common questions that you get is what can we do uh, to bridge the divide between the Tea Party and the establishment? Um, how do we all get on the same page? Um, and, and part of why the conservative movement exists, part of why the Tea Party exists, I think is because of a sort of genetic flaw that exists within a party of limited government. Um, the genetic flaw of the Democrat Party is, you know, as Thatcher said, um, that the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of everyone else's money. And you see this playing out, especially at the states right now, where you know, how do you balance within a state balanced budget the demands of, of Medicaid versus the demands of teachers unions and education? I think that you're seeing uh, that kind of genetic flaw on the left play itself out. The genetic flaw on the right of a party of limited government is that you elect politicians to come to Washington to give up power, to give up the ability to write rules, to give up the ability uh, to steer resources to your, your constituencies um, and give that power back to the civil society. Um, and I think until and, and unless the, the state of Ohio starts sending Cincinnatus to Washington instead of John Boehner, you're always going to have that sort of tension between a conservative movement that believes in its heart in limited government and believes in its heart in civil society and the politicians who are sent to Washington that are forced to follow through um, on those commitments. Um, I do think that there's two things that are going on in the country right now that make the conservative movement stronger than it's ever been and therefore um, if you want to call the conservative movement the Tea Party, uh, much as Paul Weyrich called the conservative movement the New Right in the 1980s, um, uh, the Tea Party more strong. And, and one of them is technological. If you go back to 1995, 83% of the profits in the record industry are controlled by five large record labels, EMI, Sony Music, so on and so forth. And technology comes around um, and says, we're going to change the model. It's no longer these five companies that will control every single part of the production process from finding the talent, training the talent, producing the records, distributing it, um, and ultimately capturing those profits, you have Napster coming around, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, iTunes, um, and ultimately Justin Bieber gets found on YouTube, a totally different uh, model for the music industry. And now the five largest record labels um, in the music industry today have about 23% of the profits. Uh, you're seeing the exact same thing happening down the road, you know, 10, 20 years later in politics right now. We no longer live in a world where a politician can go home and brag about the earmark that he brought home um, in, the, in the era where there were earmarks without somebody having read the legislative text online, gone through and said, well, you're leaving out the other 10,000 earmarks and the bridge to nowhere in Alaska um, that was part of the package that let you bring home the bacon to our district. You no longer live in a world where a member of Congress can go home to his district and say, I just voted for a farm bill, and this is a good thing for our district because we're a farm district, without somebody having read that and realized that 80% of the farm bill um, is food stamps. And you had a great article in the Wall Street Journal uh, during the height of the farm debate uh, last year, going back to Marlon Stutzman's district in Indiana, one of the top ag districts, and talking to farmers uh, who were proud and supportive of Marlon Stutzman voting against a farm bill because they realized that while there was some benefit coming to themselves, in the grand scheme of things, the 80% of the bill that was food stamps. And so you have blown up through technology, through the ability for people to read bill text online, uh, the monopoly on power that the two political parties had to explain their voting record, uh, to go home and say uh, one thing in their home district while voting differently um, here in Washington. Uh, the second reason I think the grassroots are, are more powerful today is that, frankly, Washington, D.C. is just worse than it was 10, 20, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and certainly there were many problems in the past. But when you look at the cronyism that goes on in Washington, 
Um, it, you know, Jefferson said that a, a government big enough to give you everything you want is powerful enough to take everything you have. That's not just a steady state outcome that we might one day reach or may have already met. It's a relationship that when you have a tax code that's longer than the King James Bible, that when you have a regulatory regime that takes a trillion dollars out of the economy, when you have a federal budget of $3.8 trillion, there is more opportunity for Washington, D.C. to give out favors um, for these special interests, for the, the specific beneficiary in Washington, at the expense of the taxpayer or the forgotten man um, or the general welfare all, all across the country. And, and you can see this if you go back. Congress came back this week to, to start their lame duck. And all of the Washington reporting, Politico, um, is about the action-packed December and everything that has to get done. Uh, and think about everything that, that comes out in these articles through the framework of, of an American out there who's seen his median wage the same as it was when Ronald Reagan left office, who sees families collapsing all around uh, him and his community, who sees all of the prices in his life going up, let it be the cost of education and higher education, housing, energy, food, beef hitting $4 a pound. And Washington comes back and says, if we don't pass TRIA, the terrorism risk insurance um, benefit, uh, then, you know, the world's going to grind to an end. If we don't extend tax extenders, the vast majority of which are nothing but special interest handouts, the world's going to come in. We have to, we have to pass a trillion-dollar omnibus. Washington doesn't speak to the real anxieties of the American people. Um, and given an environment where it's easier than ever to organize, we shouldn't be surprised um, that the conservative movement is stronger. But it's not just the conservative movement. If you, you can tell a lot about a civilization by its pop culture. And when you look at the pop culture of the United States today, you have House of Cards, very popular on Netflix, not just with, with the Tea Party movement, that basically says that there are politicians who are willing to murder, lie, and steal for no reason other than gaining power. Uh, if you look at Scandal, also a popular TV show, saying politicians are willing to murder, torture, and steal for no purpose other than the, the, the kind of pleasure of gaining power. The, the premise of The Daily Show is that this whole thing is a game. This whole thing is, is an exercise in coming up with a messaging amendment so that we can turn it into a 30-second ad um, and kind of fool the American people in, into continuing the status quo. Um, and so I think you see all through this country a sense that Washington, D.C. isn't working for me. It's not addressing the anxieties that I have. In fact, it is exploiting me uh, to take care of those people who are in Washington, D.C. And we shouldn't be surprised, therefore, that you have the type of populist uprising that we see. And so I guess I'll just conclude with where do we go from here. And I think that there's a very active debate going on in the Republican Party right now about what the policy agenda of the future is. Um, and the first, uh, Ross Douthat has called it the donorist agenda, the Acela Corridor's preferred agenda. It's laid out in the RNC's autopsy, which is very explicit. And any time you hear somebody say that there's no disagreement on the right about the end goal or where we're trying to go, there's just a disagreement on tactics. The RNC autopsy of what went wrong in 2012 says that we need to stop talking about the social issues. It says that we have to provide amnesty and worker permits for four or five um, million people here illegally in the country says that we have to, uh, on kind of most of the major problems that face America, have more of a messaging-based approach um, than a kind of fundamental rethinking of what a reform agenda would look like. That is the solution of the establishment. Um, and it works well for those people in the Acela Corridor. It works well for people who are, who are in Washington, D.C. right now with a status quo that benefits them um, and was built to benefit them. I think the other agenda and the Tea Party agenda is saying that, that there's many different manifestations of it. We call it here at Heritage something um, our agenda, opportunity for all, favoritism to none, um, that actually looks at these struggles that most Americans face out there, again, with, with median income um, that's, that's, uh, that's been stable since, since Reagan left office, with the collapse of the family, um, which all the rest of it, debt spending, et cetera, it doesn't matter if you don't have stable families and a, a flourishing civil society uh, from which people can, uh, can prosper. Um, and looks at what, how, do we, how do we change the dynamic in Washington, D.C.? How do we change a system that is very much not broken, but rather a finely tuned machine to make sure that special interests in Washington uh, work? How do we change those systems and instead come up with Mike Lee's Higher Education Reform and Opportunity Act, which blows up the accreditation cartel in higher education and replaces it instead with a kind of federalism-based approach to accreditation? Ted Cruz's um, energy legislation legislation that actually speaks to the price pressures and the wage pressures that most Americans who feel unheard in Washington are right to feel unheard in Washington and are looking for a party uh, with an exciting agenda to move forward. Um, and so I think those are the, the, the structures of the two debate and, and, and that ultimately if Washington DC is um, this finely tuned machine that gives out favoritism, it's impossible for those of us who want to have 
an aggressive policy agenda, who want to move the country in a different direction to succeed unless we do damage to the status quo in Washington. Um, that when the tax code is specifically structured to give benefit to those who have earmarks, you cannot have fundamental tax reform unless you upset some people on K Street who are invested in the status quo. That if you're trying to have an improvement to the higher education system, a modern education system where, um, where every, every person who goes to college doesn't necessarily learn in the same exact environment that people learned at Oxford 800 years ago, um, you're going to do damage to some of the uh, special interests in Washington that are invested in the status quo. Um, and so I think that marrying this, this kind of these, these policies that can provide opportunity, um, the policies of a conservative reform agenda, uh, with an explicit uh, uh, willingness to attack the favoritism of Washington, D.C., is really the only way forward. It's the only way forward to have reform and is why all of us who are invested um, in having a reform agenda need to be equally invested in the continued growth and success of the conservative movement of the Tea Party um, against the forces of the status quo and, and the establishment here in town. Thank you. So I'd like to ask the first question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, the theme of this lecture series is lessons for conservatives. I'm sure we're going to have several members of the Tea Party watching online or maybe on C-SPAN. What advice would you give Tea Party members who are listening to us? Gentlemen. Well, first I'd go to heritageaction.com and look at our <laughs> scorecard. Um, but no, look, I think that we're going to save this country by having a well-informed populace that, that has greater access to information, greater ability to um, uh, find like-minded people, that somebody in Georgia can meet an activist in Michigan, and, and that between the two of them, they can go through and uh, read a piece of legislation or analyze their member of Congress's voting record um, and get engaged. You, you get the government that you deserve. And I think that the problems that our country has aren't the fault of the House or the Senate or the President. Uh, they're the fault of whether or not we are paying att enough attention to what's going on to hold our member of Congress accountable. Um, we had a, a, at Heritage Action, part of what we do is we have something called the Sentinel Program. We have 10,000 um, activist sentinels who are around the country, and we train them and teach them what to look for. We get several thousand of them on a conference call every Monday morning um, to talk through. But a couple months ago, one of them was at a town hall and had asked uh, their member of Congress about the Export-Import Bank and what he thought about the Export-Import Bank and, and um, you know, how he could defend voting for something that sent 75 percent of its loans to companies like GE, Caterpillar, and Boeing, and the rest um, to Russian, uh, Russian oligarchs, drug cartels in, in South America, and the richest person in Australia. And he said, well, it's a really important issue, and, and I'm going to go talk uh, to my LD, and I'll get back to you on, on how I'm going to vote on that. And the activist said, well, actually, you voted two days ago to reauthorize it. Um, and when you have that type of accountability, that type of well-informed uh, citizen who's paying attention to Washington isn't letting the politician get away with the first answer, I voted for a farm bill because we're in a farm district, um, but instead is asking follow-up questions, per pursuing kind of a journalistic responsibility of knowing what's going on and asking follow-up questions, I think you get much better governance. Um, and you get politicians who start improving their voting records because they can't get away um, with preserving the status quo. Yeah, I'm, I'm nodding my head uh, furiously because I agree entirely with that. And just to, just to build on what Mike said, I mean, I think there's an opportunity now. I mean, you talked a little bit about the, 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 the record labels and the fact that, you know, it used to be five and, and 1995 uh, that controlled everything. Now it's 23 percent. Um, and I agree that that's been, you know, a, a significant, it's had a significant impact. Technology's had a significant impact, obviously, not only in the record industry, but in particular in politics and in a way that allows people to be much more involved, much better informed than they could have been. You don't have to go to the library like you had to mm -hmm. 50 years ago. You can, get, you can get on your computer in the comfort of your own home and read the bills. I do wonder, though, um, you know, you mentioned Justin Bieber and YouTube. Is that a positive <laughs> outcome? Because I might have. He's changed. a big fan. That's why. I, I wasn't going to say it, but um, the the I think so. I think that's the the sort of short answer to your question. I get that question a lot. You know, sort of what what can we do? It's the what can we do question at the end of, of a talk or a panel, and that's exactly what you can do. I mean, there there is no real qualification to be a journalist. You don't have to. You know, you can go to journalism school if you want. You don't have to. You don't have to know anything special to be a journalist. But you can go to a town hall and you can ask a question because you know as much or more than the elected official you're asking. Um, produce a result, get a change, uh, embarrass the heck out of somebody. And that's, uh, in, in many cases, a positive thing. 
Well, just briefly, um, I think uh, you know, much can be done through the, the suggestions already made, but bear in mind uh, this thing called the Tea Party is, uh, has many different positions on different issues, different strands of it. So you can't just uh, uh, begin by thinking that if people inform themselves and call themselves Tea Party, that we're going to solve many of the problems because Tea Party people themselves disagree. Take foreign affairs. Um, you know, you have an isolationist Tea Party, you have an internationalist Tea Party strand. So um, we, we shouldn't uh, uh, disillusion ourselves, uh, uh, operate under the illusion that just because the Tea Party exists that the problems uh, are going to be solved. They're going to have to solve some of the problems themselves, uh, amongst themselves, about what actually they stand, and that's why I think your initial question, there's a lot of agreement on some of the things that are wrong but the direction in which we should go remains uh, open within the Tea Party itself. That was a good question, of course, because I read it in, in something you read, so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take questions from the audience. Answered everything. <laughs> There's one. Hi, over here. Sam Pim, Red Hill Strategies. Um, I, I somewhat disagree with the notion that uh, the conservative movement and the Tea Party are one and the same. And um, I say that because I've been involved in the conservative movement since 1976 when I became a volunteer for the Reagan campaign. And the, the big difference that I see is that the Goldwater activists that I got to know um, and the activists from the Reagan era and after that, um, the conservative activists were very sharp political operators. And they knew that they were in this fight for the long haul, many of them. And a lot of them have been around for years and years and years uh, participating in the fight. And when I became involved in the Tea Party movement, um, I think that a lot of the people I, I would have to classify as naive. And I think that some of the reason why the large Tea Party participation has dropped off since the early days is that uh, when we did not achieve, when the Tea Party did not achieve their ultimate goals right away, I think a lot of people became discouraged and kind of left the Tea Party movement. And it, it, it you know, it, I don't think there's much argument that it's not as vibrant as it was when when the movement first started. And so I would just like to to hear your comments about that. Yeah, I guess I, I, I disagree with the premise. I mean, I think that, um, look, there's not a, a Obamacare vote um, as to whether or not Nancy Pelosi gets to, to ram the bill through Congress coming up in the way that it was in August of 2009 when people had that um, kind of live fire drill to, to, to push at. I think the notion that you would have a huge six-month-long fight over the export-import bank um, uh, which I think is kind of this distillation of cronyism in Washington, D.C., absent some energy out in the grassroots um, to pay attention to what's going on in Washington, to sweat the details, to be well organized, um, is wrong. So I think a lot of the Tea Parties have um, become involved with, you know, let it be Heritage Action or other great groups, Freedom Works and whatnot. Um, there's certainly, um, there's not Obamacare hanging out there. There's not TARP hanging out there in terms of, of some of those huge votes. But when you look back in 2011 to the debt limit and the amount of energy that was out there through the grassroots, when you look at um, uh, the energy last year on stuff like a farm bill or the Export-Import Bank, uh, there are millions of people out there who are very actively informed. And I think that, you know, if, if uh, look at what's going on with, with immigration right now. Um, and I certainly think that if, if you had a um, Obamacare going forward right now, you would see people all through August um, getting engaged in the same way they were last year around the defund effort uh, and, you know, two years before that, uh, right after Obamacare passed. Um, so I, I, I guess I just disagree with the premise that they're not as actively involved. I, I found them, I found our activists to be some of the most well-informed, um, thoughtful people involved in politics that I run across. We had um, 300 people in Atlanta from around the country who were part of our Sentinel program. These are some of the most interesting, um, thoughtful, well-informed people out there. Um, they're not current political consultants in Washington, D.C., and I, I view that more as a feature than a bug. I think I'm in the middle of you two. Um, I, I think that, that you're right to a certain extent that when the Tea Party, when you have a movement like the Tea Party, I agree that it's a movement for the reasons that, that Jim suggests, 
has all the hallmarks of the movement, the characteristics of a movement. Um, when you have that kind of, of a movement, it necessarily attracts people who haven't, you know, who, who are excited at the beginning and haven't necessarily been involved. And you have, certainly with the Tea Party, a lot of people, I mean, the number of times I interviewed somebody either at a Tea Party rally or a political event or a, or a primary debate or something who said to me, I've never been involved in politics before. Well, okay, that's that's fair, and they they're, they're necessarily not going to have probably the level of sophistication of some of the people that you're talking about who were you know who got involved in, in Goldwater and stayed involved forever. So there's there's kind of a learning curve to use the cliche, and I think the Tea Party is is going through some of that right now. I mean, certainly that you expect the the, the white hot uh, energy at the very beginning to fade a little bit. Uh, you, you would expect that some of the people who became active, who were not political animals before that, to, be, to get the bug, you know, to really become active and to stay active and maybe become, you know, in 20 years, you sitting there asking a question of another panel. At the same time, you would expect that some of the people who never really were political animals in the first place or never were junkies or never were into these issues to be into them for a short time and then grow disillusioned, maybe disillusioned with the Tea Party movement, maybe disillusioned with the, the, the fact that you can't have instant results in our kind of messy republic. Um, so I, th I think there's, there's probably a position in between where, where both of you are. There's a question here in the front. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Professor Caesar, you said that basically polarization, polarization is in some ways good, which is to say that it can move issues to the front that uh, otherwise wouldn't be popularly debated. Um, what are other, given that polarization can't last perhaps forever, what are the other sort of immediate benefits to having this kind of vast opposition that brings sort of issues that never otherwise would have been discussed? Well. Um, Sometimes government doesn't get anything done, but sometimes it's better not to do anything. So uh, th there's no way of answering your question in the abstract other than to say that the, the American system as it's laid out uh, allows for something like uh, tension, even polarization, if, uh, if, you, if you want to call it. Plus, uh, it's not polarization so much as uh, this question of paralysis of our institutions. It, um, and, uh, which has been an issue. Paralysis means, uh, has meant uh, up until, say, 2014, when maybe even the majority looks like it's changed, paralysis meant from 2008 up until last year not going along with what the Democrats want because they claimed that they were the majority party by virtue of winning the presidency and the Senate. And the, the one that was paralyzing was a, a house, in the House, which is the most popular body, but still only one of the three uh, decision-making bodies. And therefore, it was uh, delegitimized. But you could say that um, the, the question is, uh, for, for what purpose was it delegitimized? And what ends or goals were served by this? And um, uh, uh, beginning with uh, health care issues, uh, will Obamacare survive? Um, look pretty good maybe after 2012, maybe after 2016, this will actually have changed dramatically. And when we look back on history, it will look completely different. The winning side will not be the side that people thought was going to be the winning side. And by people here, I mean most in, in, the, in the media and the intelligentsia. And, and therefore, who will be the winner? Uh, uh, I remember the, the various changes about Ronald Reagan, who was regarded as a uh, an outright extremist off the charts in 1980. Now when we look back, and not many uh, the younger people in the audience can, can remember this, uh, what Reagan was looked like in 1980, but now when we look back, people in a way look at uh, Reagan's period in office as one that did a lot of good, and looking back on this, uh, uh, they say, well, it was good that people uh, uh, in a way resisted the liberal tide. So the winners and losers of history change as the outcomes change, and I credit sometimes those who are obstinate. Uh, that's what I meant by uh, putting obstinacy or persistence as a virtue. Uh, it is a virtue, not an exclusive virtue. Moderation is a virtue too, but not all the times. But um, I think the Tea Party uh, deserves credit for that. It's obstinacy sometimes, I think, which has led to tactical blunders, but obstinacy all along, which has simply resisted some of this stuff, and the worm may finally turn to the point where what they resisted will become, in, in fact, the, uh, the victorious uh, cause. 
I guess I would just add on that. So it shouldn't be surprising that at a time when you have Barack Obama as president, there's a lot that the Tea Party has to be opposed to. If you look at where the creative energy in Washington is coming from in terms of positive policy ideas, it's the list of people that Steve Hayes mentioned at the start. Right? It's Mike Lee, it's Marco Rubio, it's Ted Cruz. Those are the people who are showing um, real policy innovation. It will take time. And having the Senate lets you do more to advance a policy. And having the presidency would certainly allow you to, to have a president. But so we shouldn't be surprised to see a lot of, of kind of stopping things coming out of, of the Tea Party. At the same time, you're seeing more positive ideas coming out of the Tea Party um, than certainly you are from, you know, 30-year incumbents. Yeah, just real quickly to pick up on, on something that, that each of you guys said. Uh, one, I think the President of the United States still thinks that he's in the majority. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you heard his press conference the day after the election, he said he speaks for the two-thirds of the American people who didn't vote. <laughs> that has somehow gives him legitimacy to do whatever he wants. So if obstinacy is a virtue, he is obstinate and maybe <laughs> virtuous. That's his interpretation of elections matter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and and as, as Mike said, I mean, it, it, it's true that that is where the real vibrancy in, in the conservative movement comes from in Washington and Republican, in sort of the Republican idea machine um, certainly comes from Tea Party or at least Tea Party friendly um, elected officials and think tanks and what have you. One other point, I mean, just, just to provide an example of how far this debate has gone, remember back in the lead up to the 2010 uh, midterms, the NRCC, National Republican Congressional Committee, was advising its candidates against embracing anything like Paul Ryan's entitlement reforms, sending out memos, alerts, you can't talk about this, you can't touch this, third rail of American politics. And that was the conventional wisdom, right? I mean, that was the cliche. Medicare reform, third rail. Social security, third rail. You can't even have the discussion. We're now at the point where we've not only had the discussion, but those kinds of reforms are in Republican budgets year after year after year. Democrats have run against those reforms. They've demagogued them just as everybody understood that they would. And candidates have survived. Not only survived, in some, some cases come out better. I mean, the, the last month of Marco Rubio's Senate campaign um, against Kendrick Meek and Charlie Crist was essentially a debate about Social Security reform. And Charlie Crist had ad after ad after ad saying, Marco Rubio's taking away your Social Security. And Rubio didn't, <coughs> didn't back off. He said, no, I'm not. Here's what I'm going to do. And he explained his position. And I just think, you know, not all of that is because of the Tea Party, but a lot of it is because of the Tea Party, because of the focus on that and because of a recognition, I think, an awareness that the Tea Party helped raise of these issues, of, of the fact that we're $18 trillion in debt right now. Uh, and that's, I think, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous accomplishment just in and of itself. And the left understands that better than the right does. So, so Nancy Pelosi passes cap and trade, knowing it has absolutely zero chance in the Senate. Because you start training your members to talk about it, you have your members going down and giving one minutes. You have members going home to their district and defending their voting record. So the left understands the value of legislating, even if it doesn't get done the next day, far better than the kind of establishment right does. We've got one last question from this gentleman here. Um, Al Milliken, uh, AM Media. What uh, interaction, uh, communication, coalitions have been built with the Tea Party and those across the political spectrum? Because I've been at some events uh, that are not conservative, and the Tea Party's been brought up. And I mean, sometimes, yeah, it's just really very negative, and sometimes it's like a mystery. And But then also there's ideas that are brought forth well, saying that they think, uh, well, this might appeal to the Tea Party. But then it was also mentioned, well, we're not the right vehicle to approach them or talk to them. And I'm just wondering uh, how political, how, how much are they willing to work with others to, to you know, get things done? Um, well, I, I think there's, there's a ton of collaboration, certainly inside Washington. You, you go out to the, you know, individual, I mean, I was just in Pennsylvania two weeks ago. Um, there's Tea Party, incredibly diverse groups of people, people of all ages, you know, skin colors, everything that, that you hear doesn't exist at Tea Parties, coming up with innovative ideas. They just uh, started a robocall the night before the Tea Party group to make sure that they're reaching out to everyone and reminding. And so um, I think there's a lot of collaboration. I mean, I think each of the each Tea Party um, that exists in different communities is in many ways kind of 
um, you know, the spirit of federalism, and, and I don't think that it's a kind of nationalized thing. We, we make a, a huge effort at Heritage Action to make sure that, you know, people see us as coming alongside them, not trying to tell them what to do. If we can't win the argument with a Tea Party leader that, you know, something we care about is worth caring about, then, you know, we may be wrong. Um, so I don't think there's a kind of national congealing, but there's certainly a sense of cooperation and um, how can we get to, to the end zone together. I'm not sure if that, that answered the question. That was an attempt to answer the question. I'm, I may have misunderstood it. Well, I mean, I've actually, I've actually been at some progressive or liberal events that, I mean, I, I think they did bring up things that it seems to me would appeal to the Tea Party. And I'm just curious if there's been that kind of interaction and working together. Uh, In terms it, of policy um, ideas? Yeah, the, yeah. So I think there's great, you know, you look a lot of, of over-criminalization. Um, there's, I think, uh, very good both on Capitol Hill and, and across the country. There's there's opportunities for collaboration on, on issues like that. And um, Rand Paul's been fantastic at looking at some of the over-criminalization issues and um, what we can do to kind of unite right and left on that. Well, please join me in thanking the panelists. And if you enjoyed this program, I'd remind you that you can view the previous three online on uh, Reagan, Goldwater, and the contract with America. Thank you. <laughs>